6. Romans chapter 6. I asked Brother James, I said, when are you going to publish a book on, the, on Romans? He says, oh, brother, we started uh, a study on Romans. He said, we got 33 lessons, and I think we're in chapter 2. So you, you think I'm long. I'm sure they were all good, and uh, uh, like most Bible study, by the time you finish a book, you've literally studied from Genesis to Revelation because it's all uh, encompassed in, uh, in the, the doctrines that God gives of how things begin, how they continue on, where they went bad, how to make them right, and uh, how, they, uh, how they conclude. So at any rate, uh, we'll uh, read a few verses here, and then we'll come back and, and pick up our text. But I want to look at another verse with you also. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized to, into his death? Therefore we are baptized, uh, buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I want to read you another verse here, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, and towards the end of that chapter, I'm well, actually right at the end of the chapter, uh, verse 57 and 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, 58. Don't lose Romans. We'll be back there in a minute, and we'll, have, we'll do our preaching out of that as our text. But I just want to point out something here for you. I don't know about you, but a lot of days I get up and I don't feel like a winner. I feel like I'm just lucky to be alive. <laughs> and, and then sometimes I'm not so sure that's anything good. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God, which give us us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say he's going to give us the victory. He's given us the victory. We ought to be living in victory. We ought to have overcome at least something in this world to enjoy the victory he's given us. Verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, I know a lot of people that are saved. And I know a lot of people that if you were to quote those verses to them, they would agree that that's so. But their lives don't reflect any victory whatsoever. Their lives don't manifest any idea of really living in the, uh, in the glory cloud of the Lord, or having achieved any real successes, you'd think life was just one miserable, long harangue, and uh, being a Christian was the most uh, difficult and troublesome prospect on their horizon. Well, I would, I would say this. There are certainly challenges uh, in the Christian life. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I mentioned this morning, you get saved, you get the greatest... Uh, advocate that this uh, a man could ever have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you also get the greatest enemy a human being could have in the devil. He takes his, uh, uh, his job as adversary to the uh, people of God quite serious. And it says in uh, uh, 1 Peter 5, 80, go about that a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So this idea of, uh, of uh, victory, it comes with some challenges, but it is victory. Nevertheless, it's victory. At the end of World War II, there were final victories in, uh, in Europe, but the skirmishes and the out in the hinderlands went on for a while until everybody got the word, it's over. We've, we've, we've either, if you're on the one side, won, or the other side, lost. It takes a while for all that to, to get settled. You and I are on the winning side, but the world can never acknowledge that, or it would have to admit it's on the losing side. So when we think about uh, being victorious, it is a victory in, uh, in kind and in type. We've been given some victories over some things that the natural man doesn't even think are a struggle because he's not struggling with them. Before I got saved, there was no, no struggle in my life not to swear, not to drink, not to, not to cuss up a storm, not to t talk nasty to people. There was no struggle there. I just did it, and it was felt pretty good. After I got saved, there was a struggle in the, between my spirit and my flesh. You ought to be what the Lord wants you to be. 
and God gave us the victory in that. We've got all the resources. We've got the, uh, we, we've got a, uh, in a sense, a trophy case here that shows the glory of the precious blood of Jesus Christ shed, accomplished its goal, has defeated the devil. It's all over for all practical purposes except the winding down. And that's where we live today. Uh, many people talk about victory, but I think few people live there. We might pass through that, <laughs> that, that situation on occasion, but if the truth be told, we're on the glory side. We're on the victory side. We are in Christ. We are sealed. Uh, we are seated. We are uh, represented. We are uh, given access to the throne of mercy and grace. God calls us there as often as we will, as often as we desire to come boldly to talk to him about our needs. And yet we kind of kind of lay back and say, well, yeah, but there are just too many things going against me. We're going to come to a couple of words through this, this uh, message today that people have a hard time with, and yet we do it all the time. When we uh, make plans, we, uh, when you folks uh, decided to come up to visit family in Connecticut, you know what you did? You reckoned you had a, a vehicle that would get you here. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't have started. He said, I don't think it'll make it. Well, what, what fool would jump in a car they don't think is going to go anywhere and wait? Well, I'll take that back. <laughs> no, you, you know what I mean? You, you're reckoning, you're accounting that it can get us there. Why? It's been faithful. It's been reliable. It can do it. So when we think about our life in Christ, now, somebody tell me where God's failed you. Just, just one example. Just, just anybody pick one out. I mean, to hear some people tell it, you think God never came through for them. I'm waiting for the one example where God didn't show up and, and give you a victory. If it's one he said he'd give you, it's yours. It's already done and sealed. So when we think about these things, we have to realize that victory is not a work that we have accomplished. Victory is a situation in which we reside. Christ won the victory. He won a victory over sin and death and hell. I already have a promise from him, and he can't lie, and his promises can't be broke, and he's as more powerful than any other uh, individual or groups or gangs or uh, bunches that can come about anywhere in uh, anything that's been created, that he's going to keep me safe. Either I can rest in that and reside in that and live in that and revel in that, or I can doubt it. So part of victory comes by faith. I simply trust God at what he said, and I account that what he said will get me where he said he'll take me. Victory is obtained by faith. The Bible says over in 1 John 5, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. I think a lot of times we look at that and say, well, then I'm not going to make it. If your faith is in what you can do, you may be right. If your faith is in what Christ has done, it's already in the bag. It's already a done deal. We've already uh, achieved that victory. And today I want to talk about just four simple things. Nothing, nothing complicated tonight, nice and easy. Four simple things about uh, our relationship with victory, with the victor, and uh, with the victorious spirit. We read through uh, verses 1 through 4. Verse 5 simply uh, continues along in Romans chapter 6, verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Again, that's the continuation of those accounting that what God has done, what God has said, what Christ accomplished on the cross, what Christ uh, carried into hell and left there, what, we, uh, what he rose from the dead to, to get done is a done deal if we live in that. So our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ is a glorious thing. When somebody says, how are you doing? I, I think I mentioned this before one time. I had a guy ask me one time, I was standing in line over at the grocery store. There's a guy I used to go to church with and uh, had my a jacket on and it said, Victory Bible Baptist Church. And he kind of trying to be a wise guy says, hey, is there any victory in the Baptist church? I says, uh, well, there, there's victory in Jesus. I said, I, maybe you wouldn't know anything about that in the church you're in. <laughs> but, as, you know, all, all kidding and joking aside, 
What our goal is in life as Christians is to tell people what it's like to live in victory, what it's like to live on the glory side. If we're always walking around with, oh, poor me, you don't know what this is like, you don't know what this is all about. I had a guy ask me one time, he says, uh, if God's so good, how come your wife has got so many medical issues? I said, I'll be honest with you, just because that's the way life is. Death passed upon all, and I have never met a person in my life or heard of a person that died of good health. Everybody dies of something. You might die suddenly in, in decent health, but you didn't die of good health. You died from something else. I said, but I'll tell you one thing. It sure is good to be saved and have a God to talk to about it. It sure is good to have a God that's in heaven and died to save you, raised, uh, came up from the dead to guarantee your life and to uh, assure you uh, that you have an ever-living intercessors in glory to, to come bring your problems to. Because it sure gives you some comfort that the world doesn't know anything about. They're too busy being critical of uh, what they think a Christian ought to be to ever find out what the Bible says they are. They're sinners, dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians goes on so far as to say that when you were with, yet without hope to addressing lost men, uh, he said, you were without God, you were, without, uh, you were uh, alienated from the promises of God, uh, not part of the commonwealth of Israel, and you were without hope and without God in the world. Imagine that. You know, to a lost man, that doesn't mean anything. He's been without God since he was born. He figures kind of typically, I got this far along, I will be okay. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. You won't after you die, I can guarantee you that. You might do really well. You might be one of the richest men in the world until you die, and then you're going to leave it all in a bank account, and family's going to be fighting over it, and you're going to be in hell burning like a, uh, like a piece of charcoal. What you got to do is get on the winning side while you can. You know, the day declares that today is the day of salvation. And there's people that they're running around, well, some other day, you know, on a better day, when I get older, when I get more settled, when I, uh, you know, get, when I live out all my, my wild dreams. Yeah, you, you're pretty bold thinking you're going to live that long. That's a, that's a pretty... Uh, sad way to be. Our, ident our identification with him in salvation. And this is where a lot of folks go wrong. Uh, let me take a, a bit of a diversion, but it's just a, a, by way of uh, explanation. In Romans chapter 6, uh, verse uh, 3, it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And the majority of the Christian world, at least professing Christian world, reads water. That's not talking about water. Uh, the word baptism means to be immersed in, but you're not immersed in water. You're immersed into Jesus Christ. Well, how in the world do you get yourself in there? The simple answer is you don't. The Holy Spirit of God comes along and takes you, and when you trust Christ, when you have faith in Him, and you place your, your trust in Him for you to be your Savior, to cleanse you from sin, the Holy Spirit puts you in there as part of his body, makes you bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. So inasmuch as I've been baptized into Christ, what's the devil going to do to him? How is the devil going to attack me if I'm part of him? I got the victory. I'm beyond the devil's reach. If the devil puts his hand on me, it's only going to be in a case like uh, uh, Job where God, where the devil comes to God and said, let me, let me, you know, that guy is just loving you because of what you're giving him, what you're doing for him. But I, man, I'd say to a big, amen to that. God's good to me. But that's not all the truth by a long shot. He said, you let me take away this. You let me do that. You let me, you'll see he'll curse you to your face. And God said, all right, just don't kill him. Think about that for a second. Is that the God that you want? That says, yeah, just don't kill him. Have your way with him. Just don't kill him. I'd rather have a God like that that allows me an opportunity to prove my faith, what I say, by my life, than a God that says, no, I don't want him. John Calvin, he got nothing going. The devil says, uh, I'll take him. And God says, you ain't taking nothing. When you're in Christ, that Bible says that uh, if God be for us, 
Who can be against us? And it goes through a list of everything that you could imagine, and it says nothing. Nothing. God's on our side. We're winners. Come on, smile. You're winning. <laughs> In salvation, we identify with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that it goes on to describe here. It says in verse 6, Know this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Yeah, the, you know, the problem is, though, it don't want to stay dead. Every time I turn around, it keeps jumping back to life. It's got to be put into submission. It's got to be held at bay. It's got to be held back, or this old flesh will ruin your life. It'll spoil your victory. It won't take it away. But it'll spoil the enjoyment of it to the point where God might have to come in and do something in your life. So our, ident our identification and salvation is we're, we die with him. Now, when we baptize in water, everybody, I, I, I suspect, understands this clearly. When you go down under that water, that's a picture of being dead and buried. Guy says, well, in our church, we just, we just give it one of these things. They must be a Methodist. Well, that's fine, except when was the last funeral you went to at a graveside service and they just threw a body into the ground and a handful of sand on it and everybody went home? That's not a burial. I don't know what you call that, but it isn't baptism either. It's not immersed into anything. You're fully involved in Jesus Christ. He is fully involved in you. There's no part of you that Christ has not purchased uh, spirit, soul, and body, but he's not made that final claim on the body yet because that's yet coming when that trumpet blows and the Lord calls us home at the rapture or in the resurrection, uh, depending on whether you're alive or dead, how you, what you want to call that. So our baptism identifies us with his death. Our burial puts all that away. A guy asked me one time, he says, Preacher, you keep talking about sin and feeling guilt for sin. He said, I don't feel any guilt for it. And I said, that's because you're a lost man. He said, well, what do you mean? I don't, I don't understand that. I said, if, if we were having a funeral at our church and you had the casket laid out up front and uh, there's, a, there's a dead man in there. He said, well, you go up there and poke him in the arm. What's he going to say? He's not going to say anything. He's dead. I said, suppose you start piling weight on him. How much weight would you have to, to put on there? For he screams out in pain, help, I'm under all this weight. Get me out of it. He says, well, you, he couldn't. He's dead. You're looking at you dumb preacher. Don't you get it? He's dead. And I said, yeah, he is dead. That's why you don't feel anything. You're dead. The minute the Spirit of God starts working in people's lives, all of a sudden they begin feeling these pains of conscience. They begin getting a twinge of guilt. And all of a sudden they think, that preacher, somebody told them all about me. Somebody's been ratting me out. Did you tell him what I did? See, they, they can't imagine that God could actually come from glory, work in their lives, in their hearts, convicting them of their own sin. Somehow that's beyond it until they realize why else would I begin to feel like this? I didn't want to. That wasn't my plan to feel guilty. And then all of a sudden you realize, I am a sinner. I am doing those things. So in our baptism, whether it's a spiritual baptism, is the real death of Jesse Smith. He doesn't count anymore. Why not? He's dead. All his old sins are counted as finished because he's dead. Somebody else paid for him. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm not going to have to. So we identify with Christ in his burial. He's put into the ground for three days. Aren't you glad he didn't stay? You know, somebody says, well, they've never found anything of his bones. I says, he's not there. He's not dead. What, you go looking for a living man's bones, you're going to have to find him. So if you want to find Christ today, you've got to look for him in a place where he's living. You might find him in another believer. You might find him in glory. But you ain't going to find him in religion. And you ain't going to find him in the ground. He didn't even have a tomb. He just needed to borrow one for a few days. <laughs> Rental, easy loan, tombstones. In our living, we identify with his resurrection. 
Anybody ever hear of a, something called the swoon theory? The swoon theory is how the unbelievers explain Jesus' miraculous revival uh, after being beaten, pummeled by soldiers, crown of thorns beat down on his head, nailed to a cross uh, and, and bled out, spears pierced his side and out comes blood and water. That means that your, your, your body is dead. Your, your, uh, the red cells in your body and the plasma have separated. You're not alive at that point. That's, that's how you see, kind of gross, but if you've ever seen a dead body, it's uh, the lower side of it will be red or discolored, look like a big bruise, and the upper side is just pale. All of the heavy red blood cells settle in the plasma parts up here because they're dead. He died. Well, their take is, yeah, and they laid him in that, in that tomb. And as he laid in there in that tomb, he revived. And when he came out, he managed to convince the disciples he'd overcome death. Anybody believe that? I don't have that kind of faith. I don't have that much faith. I can believe that he's God manifest in the flesh, that he died on that cross to finish the work of paying for every man's sin. I can believe that he carried those sins to hell and left them there. I can believe that the body laid in that tomb for three days, but the idea that it just sprang back to life because it was laying on a stone cold slab, I'm not buying into that story. And then convincing the disciples that he was raised in power. Anybody in here ever stick a nail in their foot? You walk kind of funny for a while. Imagine Jesus coming out of that tomb. I did it. <laughs> here, Thomas, put your hand, your hand, not a finger, your hand in my side. How could Thomas do that? Still open. I mean, Jesus didn't invite him to do something he couldn't do, I don't think. He could still do it. Well, why wasn't there blood running out? The blood's been shed. That was the sacrifice. That was the payment. I got victory in that. I live in victory because of what he's done. You know, people are, oh, I'm just so tired of this, and I'm tired of that. I'm tired of everything. I'm just tired. <laughs> in my mind, I'm just tired. <laughs> But I've never gotten tired of thinking about what my Savior's done for me. I've never gotten tired of thinking about, oh, one of these days that trumpet's going to blow. Every time I think about that, I think about Sister Rose Monnet. At 82 years old, she, she, she had several things physically go wrong with her, but that lady had been almost 82 and never been sick. I mean, I don't think she'd ever been in the hospital. And she had a horrible case of shingles, poor thing. I mean, she looked like somebody dragged her down the road behind a car. And she says, you know, I never really imagined dying. I always thought I'd go up in the rapture. Why is that? Victory? Say, well, it was a foolish hope. No, 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 no. It was not a foolish hope. It was the blessed hope to avoid laying in a hospital bed dying of a painful case of shingles, and that virus just affects your whole body. I mean, one into the other. That poor lady suffered terribly at the end there. She said, uh, told me one time, she says, but you know, I know why God did this. Really? I said, why do you think? She says, because every time I see the doctors and the nurses, I tell them about Jesus, how wonderful it is and how comforting it is to know that I'm saved. And she just went on and on and on. And she says, they don't have the nerve to tell me to shut up. <laughs> she, was, she was quite a lady. She was quite a lady. She, you know what she did? She exercised her victory. She didn't let anything intimidate her. She didn't let herself get pushed down, beat down, abused. She just, and as, as meek and mild as a person could possibly be. How are you using your life for the Lord Jesus Christ? 
you and I, 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 one of the things I've learned as I get older, I have a little bit more liberty to say things that younger people either can't or probably shouldn't say, simply by virtue of uh, uh, gray hair and uh, wrinkles on my face. And people look at it, you know, most people, they just kind of dismiss it as uh, you know, just a, some old guy wanting you to do what they want to do. But you know what it is? It's experience. Man, I've lived. I, I've been through some stuff. I've seen God do some things. I've seen God save people. I've seen God change people's lives from drug addicts and drunkards and, and just every level of, of a vile life you can imagine and give them victory. I don't see this, the world doing that kind of life-changing uh, therapies for people, but the Savior can do that. So we identify with Christ both in our, in our salvation, in the, uh, the baptism, both spiritual and water baptism later on, but also among the living. Look with me, uh, save your place in Romans. Look over with me in Philippians chapter 2. This, this is where we're uh, being constantly aware of victory in Christ can take you. In uh, chapter, uh, chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse uh, 12, Paul writes by the inspiration of God, uh, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This, this applies to some of my other points here as well, and I'll just mention it in passing for now. Maybe we'll have a chance to come back to this. There ought to be something about our daily life that lets people know we are saved. I'm trusting Christ. Now listen, you can't walk down the street and there's a look at he's smiling there's a Christian I've met people that think they can what they're waiting for is somebody to come why are you so wonderful well I'm a Christian I'm serious that, that's what they're waiting for listen that may happen I, I don't think it's ever happened to me uh, but it may, it may happen to you but God didn't say go out in the world he said let your light shine that they, they may see that light and glorify your Father which is in heaven. But if they don't know that your Father in heaven is the one that gives you that light, all they're going to do is pat you on the back and you're going to think you're wonderful as they think you're wonderful. That Bible says, preach the gospel to every creature. Tell them the hope that lies within you. Tell them what great things the Lord's done for you. Tell them how He redeemed you. Tell them how He just bought you off the auction block of Satan's slavery and bondage and gave you a, a, the liberty and life in a glorious eternity with Himself. You can't, you can't convey that by a look on your face. You can look happy. You can look at peace. You can look all kinds of things. But people can't read that in there. They can't, they can't even read that reading in the words in the Bible. They need somebody to tell them what it's like to live in the victory of a resurrected Savior. He says, uh, For it is God which worketh in you both the will and the do of His good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. I think we could probably just stop and preach on that for the rest of the week, but I don't want to get myself too convicted before I finish tonight's message. So let's just say that we ought to have a life that has more praise in it than complaining. We ought to live a life that has more glory in it than, uh, than disputing. And we ought to live a life of thankfulness for what the Lord has uh, given us and what the Lord has saved us from. And uh, never mind what maybe the Lord and in His infinite wisdom and kindness has withheld from you that would have been damaging to your soul. He does know better than you and I, doesn't He? Yeah, so let's, let's not complain about what we don't have or what we think we've missed out on. Count it all glory when you've missed out on that. That's just God's good judgment. Then it says in verse 15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Okay, I'm going to walk down the road and I'm going to let my light shine. People are going to see, boy, that, that preacher, he just dressed up nice. He looks good. He's really shining. I wonder why. 
tells you why. Holding forth the word of life. Now listen, I don't think that's walking down the, down the street with a Bible out. Hey, anybody want to look at a Bible? This is the word of life. I mean, that's true. And if you do that, maybe you might draw a crowd. <laughs> maybe get somebody with a butterfly net. But holding forth the word of life is just giving people the opportunity to know Christ, to know where that life comes from, that it isn't from you, it isn't from our church, it isn't from the pastor, it's from Christ himself. We're living in his victory. It's not our victory we got to keep thinking about, it's his victory. My life is one of, of monumental, yeah, on and on and on. And every now and then there's a little bleep on the, on the chart there. Oh, that was a good day. In Christ, every day is a glory day. Every day is the peak of the charts. Every day is the top of that, uh, of that scope. If all I got to do is set my mind to think on the things he's done for me, the way that God has moved in our lives and our families and our churches. And say, yeah, but you've got a lot of things that are, that, are, that are going wrong around you. Yeah, but you know what? It ain't Christ. He's still living in victory. I'm still in Him. I'm still seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm still destined for glory with Him. I'm still going to live in the millennium. I'm still going to have a great time in eternity. What's your problem? <laughs> Good to be saved, isn't it? It says, holding forward the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. You know what so many Christians think? This is really sad. I've seen this uh, just countless times over. They, they go for a year, two years, five years. I've seen people 10, 15 years. And then they just, it's like they just quit. And you, well, what's that all about? Well, I'm, I'm just discouraged. Discouraged at what? Living in this present evil world? I, God told you what it was. Uh, discouraged that God isn't giving you everything you think you deserve? He told you he'd give you everything that you needed. Well, relationships go sour. Listen, out of the 12 disciples, all of them, but, but one of them left him at the cross. Judas Iscariot betrayed him, sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, isn't it necessary that offenses come? What, what's the problem? Well, we begin thinking more about what we're missing, what we don't have, how, how the world's looking at us. And quite frankly, if you think about how you looked at Christians before you got saved, it'll take away all your questions. You thought they were nuts. You thought anybody that would go to church more than once a week was completely out of their mind. They were a little bit loose just to go once. But the idea of going Sunday morning and then again Sunday night and then going back for prayer meeting Wednesday and God forbid maybe meeting with some other folks on the street corner to hold the gospel signs that people are going to laugh at and people are going to point fingers at and on a Saturday and then maybe passing out tracts all week long. You realize that's where the victory is. That Christian life is not boring. I think I talked about that a little bit this morning. If your life is boring as a Christian, you're not living as a Christian. You're living as a quasi-Christian. I didn't say you're not saved, but you're not living up to the potential that God says as those shining lights, as sons of the living God, holding forth the word of life. You know, every time you hold a Bible out to somebody, every time you offer somebody a track, let me tell you one thing you better be ready for, rejection. And some people can't tolerate that. Rejection is, is not in their their uh, DNA. If you're a Christian, you'd better get used to it. You say, well, I'm telling them the truth. It's the best thing that ever happened, right? And they just don't have enough sense to take their own mercy seriously. And when we think about uh, what God has done for us, anybody in here get saved the first time you heard the gospel? Second, I, I man, somewhere down the line, you, you eventually get saved. But until then, everything was just kind of crazy. Yeah, a dead man come up from the ground 2,000 years ago, and I'm going to live forever because of it. Sure you are. But it's true, isn't it? And see, once you begin to realize 
That's, that's absolutely true. We're not living as apologists for, well, you know, we've got to believe this stuff because we're Christian. You don't have to believe anything. I'm believing it because it's true. I'm believing it because it's historically validated. I'm believing it because that's where the victory in this world is. It's the only victory in this world. You can't think of another thing that's going to go with you to glory. You can't even think of a, another thing that a man has that's better than knowing he has eternal life. Well, you know, what's his name? has got uh, umpteen billions of dollars. And he's got all the ulcers that go with that, too. Uh, yeah, well, I'd like to have ulcers. <laughs> uh, what's his name there? Uh, John Rockefeller. He was uh, one of the uh, America's earliest multi-multi-millionaires. You know what he said one time? He says, I'd give anything to just be able to eat something without my stomach being so upset. The guy just, had, he had so much money, but he had so many problems. And he professed to be a Christian. You know what the problem was? He let what he had deprive him of what was good. He let it take the joy. He let it take, rob him of the victory of just living for the Lord Jesus Christ. As, listen, rich people can do that just as well as poor people, maybe even easier. Man, when rich people talk, people typically listen to them. I don't know about that. Death frees us from a lot of things. It frees us from our sin. In verse uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Let me ask you something. What can a lost man serve besides sin? It, can he do anything that pleases God? Over in... Uh, Romans chapter 8, look at verse, uh, verse 7 and 8. Romans 8, verse 7 and 8. It says, because the, carnally mind, uh, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It, it's at battle with God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It, that's why religion doesn't work. Religion is not an asset to anybody. It's a hindrance to everything. When you believe religious things, contrary to what the Bible teaches... You're accepting lies, and the truth finds no place to come in. Verse 8, So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. This idea that uh, a lot of the Pentecostals have, well, you know, you got to have the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, and, or you got to do miracles, or you got to do something like that. That's just really nuts. Faith is not works. Works is not faith. Works ought to follow faith, but tongues is not works. Tongues is just lunacy. The Bible says it's a sign for the Jew. So when you put all these things together, you realize that uh, uh, they're not going to go anywhere. That old flesh can't please God. There's nothing about it. You realize, I'm, I'm standing in front of you as saved as any man has ever been, as any man can be. I have a blood-washed soul by the precious blood of Jesus. I have a regenerated spirit that was made lively by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and me receiving, repenting of my sin, receiving Him as Savior, and the Holy Ghost regenerated that, gave it life which was dead. But this stuff right here is the same stuff I came in with. It's the same stuff I was born with. When I got born again, this stuff didn't change at all. It's going to take one more work of God to put away that stuff. But in the meantime, God has given us tools, spiritual tools to work with, spiritual weapons uh, for our warfare. And they are not these things. They are not physical things. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not spiritual, are not carnal, but they're spiritual to the pulling down of strongholds. So death frees us from our sins. Spiritually, I'm dead in Christ. I have a life now. In verse 7, it says, For he that is dead is free from sin. Why is that? The guy says, I don't sin. And, well, a dead man don't sin either. He's not alive, but he's not sinning. He's dead. You've got to have life in you. 
Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. The very same thing that is true with Christ is true for us. We have been liberated from this body of death. Paul cries out over in chapter 7 there, uh, O wretched, the things that I would I do not, the things that I would not, that I do. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Well, the answer is Jesus Christ and He alone because no one else can do it. He can give us victory over this body, this flesh. How do you do it? Well, there's a level of participation in the Christian life. We didn't earn our salvation. We've been given it. But we read from Philippians chapter 2 that we need to work out that salvation that we've been given uh, from God with fear and trembling that we may be uh, the uh, unrebukable, harmless sons of God in a crooked and perverse world. Well, how do we do that? We yield ourselves to him, allow God to direct our pathway. And this is where the rub comes, because a lot of people don't want to yield themselves. They don't think what they do is not pleasing God. One of the reasons that we uh, perpetually encourage people to read their Bible, study their Bible, come to church, listen to preaching, listen to preaching on YouTube that's good stuff, listen, read good books that uh, men of God have written that'll help you grow. Because that old flesh is always looking for a loophole. That old flesh is always looking for a way around it. It can always find a verse uh, that justifies whatever it is that it wants to do. But what you and I need to do is we need to say, Lord, is that me doing that? Is that me just trying to find another way? I want to please you. Because see what salvation ought to engender in our lives is a desire to please the Lord. If it does not do that, I think there's every right to be questioned, is that person actually saved? Now, if they tell me they are, I'm not going to debate with them. I'm not going to tell them you can't be because of what you've done. I realize that what you did didn't get you saved, and what you do isn't going to get you lost. However, there ought to be that new man in Christ. There ought to be that Holy Spirit of God dwelling in there uh, as he is in every saved man, leading and compelling and drawing and and uh, encouraging men to put away their sin, put away their flesh, put away the disobedience, and come to Christ that he might be glorified in our daily life. Now, some folks think, well, you know, that's just who I am. You think Christ didn't know who you were when he saved you? He saved a hell-bound sinner. But he didn't intend to leave you in that condition. He wants you to be closer to Him. So how do you do that? How does that work? Well, our participation with Christ in our salvation is, is this. In verse 11, likewise reckon. We talked about that about the car and the prepared car. Uh, how many of you came in here tonight and looked at this chair and before you sat down, you... Yeah, this seems pretty good, but... Uh, you know, I, yeah, you can't tell you can trust these things and you kind of lean on the... Nah, I'm not going to put any weight on it. You know what you did? You reckoned because they're there to be sat on, it's going to hold you up. You just come in and plop yourself right down there and here you are, sitting up. Imagine that. So this idea of reckoning something is nothing more than accounting that whatever has been promised or whatever has been said can be done on your behalf by God. So likewise, reckon ye your, uh, also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. If I'm dead to sin, how much attraction does sin have to this flesh? Don't kid yourself. <laughs> it's got a lot. Somebody said, well, uh, when I was uh, growing up down the road from... Uh, Port Salerno in Florida, where I lived, the next town down was Hope Sound. And in Hope Sound, they had a, a Bible college down there. And it was uh, the uh, Pentecostal Holiness Church. And the ladies down there, they had sleeves that were this long and the ruffles covered half their hands. 
and they came up to here and they covered their neck and then they had ruffles there and they came down and they covered the tops of their shoes and they had ruffles there. And if you talk to those people, they got saved and they didn't sin anymore, ever. They never sinned after they got saved. And they could show you a Bible verse for that. If any man cry, uh, those people that are born again, he that is born again sinneth not. And you, there was no way that you'd look at those people and think, wow, they're, they're just perfect people. I mean, they were very well-mannered, nice folks. I, I don't mean to criticize them as people. But doctrinally, is that what he means? No. What's God going to hold the sin against? My soul and my spirit, because this flesh is going to go on the ground, whatever you do with it, short of the rapture. So God has cleansed us of all of that sin. There's no, never to be held against us. We are not going to the judgment seat of Christ to see if we made it. We are not going to the judgment seat of Christ to see if we sinned a lot after we got saved. We are not going to have our, uh, the uh, hairs on our, our neck pulled out by God to torture us because we're not living the way we're supposed to be. You lose rewards, plain and simple. You don't, you don't abuse your children when they don't please you. You might discipline them for the purpose of correction that they can be rewarded. So in this whole thing, what we have to do is reckon that these bodies are dead. The more I think I want to live spiritually, the less hold this flesh has on me. Most people can't, I, I don't think that's a thing that most people can grasp because the most natural thing in the world, and I use natural in every ens uh, uh, essence you could imagine to it, you want to do what your flesh tells you to do. Is, does anybody think that's really wrong? It's natural. But when it violates what God said, there has to be something in us that God has given us to equip us to not fall into that snare. And it's the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit, if you're reading your Bible, if you're praying, if you're seeking God's will for your life, doing those things, the Lord will lead you to join in with Christ in your salvation. Not to get saved, but now that I am saved, I want to glorify Him. I want my life to be a testimony. James says, you think you're saved, uh, saved uh, by your faith? I'll show you my faith. He's not talking about, I'm going to work and, and get saved. He's saying, you're, you're just going to tell me that you're saved. Well, maybe. I'm going to show you how, I, how saved I am. Well, boy, by that measure, there's an awful lot of professing saved people that got to be lost, if that's what they really think, because their lives don't show anything of salvation. I, I think of some people I've seen recently that there's nothing in their lives that, that would make you believe they're saved. But at some point, they bowed their head, they, they repented of their sin, asked Christ to save them, and then went on their merry way and gave in to every lust of the flesh, catered to every need, desire, want they ever had, and never thought two things about it. Separated themselves from the church so they wouldn't get conviction, separated themselves from Christian friends so there'd be no, uh, no guilt involved with it, and then go out in that world. You know what? They can't escape the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside them. And no matter what they do, there's still that God says, you know, that's not right. You're not pleasing the Lord with that. How, how many of you can still hear in the back of your mind when you do something you knew you weren't supposed to do, your parents' voice or, or, or something like that that says, what are you doing? Don't do that. For the Christian, that's the Spirit of God saying, how could you do that after what I've done for you? Brother Knox has a, a, a album that he put out recently, and one of the songs in there is, After All He's Done For Me, How Could I uh, Let Him Down? Boy, and you think about that, and that ought to give you some reckoning power. So he says, Likewise, reckon ye your also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Does everybody understand what to reign is? It's not water falling out of the sky. <laughs> it's not a, a hydraulic participation, <laughs> precipitation. 
to reign is to be on the throne. Now, years ago, there used to be some tracts, and it was four spiritual laws, and uh, it had a, a throne on the front of the thing. And inside, it, it, the, the illustration was quite plain. Who's on the throne of your life? Are you running your life, or is Christ running your life? Are you doing what you want to do, or are you doing what God wants to do? Are you allowing God to have His will in every part of your life, or are there, there parts where you've pushed Him off the throne, and you say, hey, ain't room enough here for two of us. One of us has got to go. That's the key, reckoning. You've got to reckon that all that you need to, to succeed, that all the victory that's there is yours, and we can live in that when we're willing to do what the Bible says. Verse 13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Isn't that an interesting word? Yield. When you yield, it's sort of a, a, a quasi-passive act. All right, you come to a, a stop sign, and if you're in a hurry, you know, the, the guy on the right is supposed to go, but you go. You didn't yield the right of way. If you come to a rotary and you're in a hurry, you speed up so that you're not going to yield. You're going to get ahead of that guy whose turn should be next. You go ahead of there. When Christ tells you to do something and you say, yeah, but I want to do this, and you put your will ahead of his, You've yielded your, your, your members as members of unrighteousness rather than saying, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. God, you, you do it. You yield. And some of it is, uh, is done in a passive fashion where we just do not even think about it. This idea today of the casual contemporary Christian church leads to the casual contemporary Christian who puts every spiritual necessity in a casual, unnecessary mode. So that any time it becomes a discussion or a debate, you just do whatever you feel like doing. After all, God knows you. He loves you. Jesus died for you. You, you said the prayer. You received Christ. But that doesn't glorify God. That doesn't reckon that you're dead to sin. That doesn't yield your members to God to use them for His glory, that in every way magnifies self, exemplifies self over the Spirit of the living God. Our participation in this is reckoning our, ourselves dead. Anybody know what, uh, 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 there's a term for it, it just, it just slid right out of my head. I wish Kevin was here, I could ask him. But there's uh, two kinds of flying. One is uh, uh, I've done a little bit of it, very little. <laughs> and it's by looking out the window and seeing where you're going. And that's fine in nice daylight and good weather and everything like that. There's another kind, it's flying by instruments. And uh, in that one, the way that you learn that is in a blocked out windshield on an airplane. I mean, it, you don't start there. but. <laughs> That's where you end up. And what you do is you learn to trust the altimeter. You learn to trust the, the, uh, the gauges that give you the pitch and everything on the plane. You learn to uh, uh, trust the, the uh, wind speed and uh, aircraft speed and all of the, the other things that are out there. Uh, so that when you look at those things, you can say, I'm at this distance, I'm at that height, I'm flying in this direction, my compass says this. How about if you don't trust those things? Are you ever going to be able to fly like that? Never. You know why? You'll always be trying to correct what's right. You can't correct what's right without going wrong. You're moving off course. You're going too high or too low or the plane is on an unnatural angle where it's going to be losing altitude. So in all of these things, you have to learn to trust something, and it's your instruments, you ultimately end up with a pilot alongside you flying blindfolded, except you're able to see the dashboard on the plane. You can't see outside the plane. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to do that. Next time you go out in the car, try it. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, it is. You don't have the instrumentation to do that. And a lost man has no instrumentation 
has no skills, no ability to know what God wants. I've talked to people over the years, and well, I know what's right and wrong. No, they don't. A lost man doesn't have any idea what's right and wrong. He thinks he does. He knows what culturally may be acceptable. He knows what he feels is right and wrong, but he's never consulted the authority on right and wrong. So when it comes to righteousness and unrighteousness, he's out in left field. His mask is completely over his head. He doesn't have his natural senses, neither does he have the ones God gave for him. So this idea of trusting what we, we account on, it's called dead reckoning in another case where you just account, if I follow this compass point, it will take me there. If I follow what the Bible says, God will take me there. If I follow something else, I don't know where I'm going to end up. But it won't be where God said, because you're not going to get there by accident. The reign of sin in men's lives destroys them. I, I think about this all the time. I know family members, their lives are just an absolute mess. And they got the, well, I'm, I'm going to get it together, and I'm going to fix this up, and I'm going to do that. You know, they're never going to do any of those kind of things. They are not capable of doing those things, neither as much anybody else. And there are other people, they live perfectly normal, productive lives in a, in a worldly kind of sense, and they think they don't need anything else, and yet they're just as displeasing to God as the drug addicts and the drunkards. But they'll never see themselves like that because their reckoning is all wrong. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. You've got to go to the Bible to find out what God's will is. You've got to yield to the Holy Spirit to be able to follow that. You've got to reckon yourself dead to sin, but alive unto God in order to fulfill those things. And if you want victory in this world, there's the recipe. Believe what God said. Reckon every word of that Bible is absolutely true to the uttermost degree. There is no safe place to turn away from it and to do your will or somebody else's will. And if you want to end up the way God uh, declares glory to end, follow Him. The rule of our service must be on display. If we yield ourselves, it says, uh, verse 13, neither yield your members ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. Did you ever think about just lending yourselves to God? Some people, well, I just gave my whole self to God. Really? Really? It reminds me of my dad uh, was telling me when he first got saved, he'd been a smoker, still smoking. He says, I, I knew it didn't please the Lord. He said, I'd go to the altar. I'd leave the cigarettes at the altar. He says, man, since church is over, I'd go back up there and get them. <laughs> he says, I'd go home at night feeling so guilty that I went and got them. I'd take them and throw them in the garbage. He says, 3 o'clock in the morning, I'd be rooting through the garbage like a, like a raccoon looking for cigarettes to smoke. He says, I, I did that over and over and over again. And he says, and then one day I, left, I took them to the altar, left them there. And I never went back. Never got him again. God gave me the victory. You know why? He reckoned he could do it. Just keep at it. Just keep working at it. Just keep applying that stuff. Keep yielding yourselves as instruments of righteousness, and God will bring the glory about to you. It says, But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Well, hallelujah. Anybody know what antinomianism is? It's an interesting big word. One of the biggest words I know. All it means is, yeah, I'm saved. I can do what I want. It's sort of a lawlessness. Listen, that's the, that's the majority of church people today. I'm saved. I can do what I want. I'm going to heaven. My sins are all forgiven. Christ died. They, they could tell you verse, scripture verses. And then think their life belongs to them. When the Lord says, yield yourselves to God, he's not saying that from a point of uh, just, well, that'd be a really nice idea. He's saying that for a point of, you bought with a price. Don't let, let's don't fight over this. 
yield yourselves. Make it a willing choice. Make it a joyful choice. Make it a profitable choice. But yield yourselves to God. Account that that old life is gone and dead. I don't want to live that life anymore. For the first time in my life, I can please God. I can do something that honors Him. I want to live in victory. Life is short. I was talking to somebody the other day, and I could see the look on their face. They are just struggling with some things in life. Another old guy. I just looked at him and said, man, life is short, isn't it? You could save and make it count. Do something that will please the Lord because you're going to be there one day. The best advice I got. Sooner or later, we're going to be face to face with the one that said, I died for you, so you didn't have to. I went to hell for you, so you didn't have to. I rose from the dead to show you that so are you coming up. Now yield yourselves as instruments of righteousness and live in the victory. We fight. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual to the pulling down of struggle. We're not fighting from a position of loss. We're fighting from a position of victory. At Calvary, the devil was defeated. It's just skirmish after skirmish now till the Lord comes and puts it all to end. Not the time to think of yourself as anything but a winner. Let's stand. One hundred and fifty seven. One fifty seven. Jesus paid it all. I'm glad that it wasn't ninety percent. <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't ninety nine percent. I'd never come up with the rest. Jesus paid it all.